So an application of the gradient vector, okay, because the gradient vector actually contains all of the um, kind of measured changes in the surface with respect to each component, right? Because our, let's say just like our, our gradient of F will be some partial derivative with respect to X and partial derivative with respect to Y. Okay, that could that could be our um, sorry. That is usually our gradient vector. It kind of contains all the possible changes, and each of those elements, f x and f y, represent the change of that surface z or f of x and y um, in the x and y directions. Okay, so if you notice, if we dotted if we dotted the gradient vector with the unit vector i, we would get specifically the rate of change of z or rate of change of the surface specifically in the x direction. And the same would happen if we did um, the gradient vector dotted with j. We would get specifically the rate of change of the surface f or z, whatever you want to call it, specifically in the direction of y. But what if we want to go in a different direction? Right? What if we want to look at how the surface is changing, not necessarily just in the x, x direction and not necessarily just in the y direction? Because not everything happens nicely along the x and y axes. What if we want to look in a different direction? Well, the concept is the same. We are going to... Um, we're going to use kind of the dot product as I showed you up here. Okay, the dot product, but we're going to dot it with a unit vector in a totally different direction. Number one, why would we want to use a unit vector? Okay, well, our result will not be dependent upon the length of the direction we would like to go, the, the length of the vector we used. Using a unit vector, okay, and if you don't have a unit vector, remember if you just have some vector v1, v2, what you can do is you can normalize it by taking the vector v, and dividing by its own magnitude. Okay, so even if you don't have a unit vector, you can always make one. Okay, um, so this will ensure that our, our result is not affected by the length of the vector we chose. We are specifically just isolating the direction by using a unit vector. Now, how um, you can think about this, honestly, um, very simply, um, <laughs> you could think about the fact that this is just a scalar projection. We are just projecting Okay, we're basically doing the component of the of the gradient vector. Okay, how much of the gradient vector is going in the direction of this unit vector? You could think about it that way, right? Because that would be um, the unit vector dotted with the gradient vector. That's that's backwards, divided by the length of the unit vector. Okay, but the length of the unit vector is one, so it's just the dot product. Okay, so you could think about it very simply by thinking about it just like we did in chapter 11 as a component projection. How much of the gradient is going in the direction of this unit vector? You can also think about it as um, specifically the slope, and this is what this kind of explanation diagram here is for, is if we have a unit vector here, Okay, and, and remember that vectors can be drawn anywhere. So I could have drawn this vector like up here. Okay, I could have drawn this vector, like I could have drawn this vector over here, or I could have drawn it over here, like it doesn't really matter. Okay, but in that giving us just the direction, let's say it's coming out of the origin. Okay, that's the same as creating kind of a line, and that's what we did down here, a line with that unit vector's direction. Okay, if we extrude that line upwards so that it intersects the surface, we get kind of this, we isolate that curve where the, where the plane, that extrusion of the line, where that plane and the surface intersect. Okay, we're basically looking for um, the slope, okay, the tangent vector kind of at that point kind of to the curve. That feels really complicated though. Okay, I like to think about it as the component. Okay, um, right. This is the slope, what we're finding, and we're finding the directional derivative given a specific direction. Okay, notice how all of these vectors I'm drawing, they're all parallel, they all have the same direction. Okay, um, and you're like, maybe you're thinking to yourself, wait a second, why doesn't the directional derivative, why doesn't just the, you know, why doesn't the gradient vector, you know, give us that already? 
Um, well, remember we haven't, we are plugging in a point, but the, as we just showed in the last video, um, the uh, gradient vector points already in a specific direction. Okay, and, and that direction is, is actually something that um, has another application that I'm gonna talk about next. So we don't necessarily, the gradient vector itself doesn't necessarily point in the direction we would like to examine the rate of change in. Okay, the gradient vector is going to point in the direction of steepest ascent, okay, which means it's going to point in, if you wanted to get to the top of the mountain, you would follow the gradient vector, but maybe your goal is not to climb to the top of the mountain. Maybe you'd like to go a different direction, okay? Maybe there's a there's a bear at the top of the mountain, okay? You don't want to go that way, okay? So um, we would like to be able to find the directional derivative in any direction, okay? Not just in the direction of steepest ascent, which we'll prove in a second. Um, and that is why we basically use something called the directional derivative, which is really just very simply the component projection or the scalar projection of the gradient vector onto a unit vector. Okay, you can also think about it as this, a slope formula, right? This is like a derivative formula right here. Okay, notice one thing is different about this derivative formula than all the other ones. We are doing both changes in the x and the y component simultaneously. That's why this is difficult. So we change x and y together. And maybe not even the same amount. Notice that a and b are two totally different variables. Um, so maybe we don't even change x and y the same amount. Okay. But again, this is okay, equivalent to the partial derivatives um, multiplied by a unit vector, or excuse me, not multiplied by, dotted with a unit vector in the direction we would like to go. Okay, so we'll do a quick example and then I'll move on to why does the gradient vector, how do we prove that the gradient vector actually points in the direction of steepest ascent? How do, how do we know that that points um, towards how to get to the mountain, how to get to the top of the mountain fastest? Okay, so if we wanted to find the directional derivative of this function at this point in this direction, notice that I had to be given a point and a direction, not just one or the other. Okay, reminder, your directional derivative Okay, and that's derivative in the direction of u of the function f of x and y is going to be equal to the gradient vector of f at the point, I should be more specific about that, at the point 3 comma negative 2 dotted with the unit vector. Now, we have to double check. Do we even have a unit vector right now? No, we do not. Okay, not a unit vector. So we have to make a unit vector. So good thing the length of r will just be the square root of 2. So my unit vector will be 1 over root 2, negative 1 over root 2. That's pretty simple. Okay. Now we need to find the gradient vector. Okay, taking the partial derivative of the original function with respect to x, that will be 4x plus y. Then original function, deriv partial derivative with respect to y, I will get x minus 2y. Specifically, gradient vector at the point 3, negative 2. Plugging that in, I am getting 12 minus 2, comma, 3 plus 4. That gives me 10, 7. So my directional derivative in the direction of u of the function f of x and y at the point 3, comma, negative 2 is, okay, 10, 7, dotted with, 1 over root 2, negative 1 over root 2. Okay, so in the end, notice that it's a scalar projection. So my, my, the, the result should be a slope. It should be a scalar. Okay, so I'm getting 10 divided by root 2, oops, not comma, minus 7 divided by root 2, which is 3 over root 2. Okay, fun times. All right, now there are a couple other things here. Here's where I talk about the fact that it is, in fact, a scalar projection. Okay, so you can use that. Um, because the scalar projection, and specifically if we're talking about, um, if our unit vector, we're thinking about it in two dimensions, our unit vector in two dimensions, if our unit vector makes an angle theta with the x-axis, you could also write u as cosine theta sine theta. But that was in chapter 11. How else can we write a unit vector? Okay, what I really wanted to get to Okay, and again, if you have more than one variable, or excuse me, if you have <laughs> functions of three variables, meaning x, y, and z are all inputs, this is what it would look like. 
Okay, so what I want to go over last is kind of this idea about how do we prove that the gradient vector is going to give us the direction in which f of x and y increases most rapidly. Now, I want to clarify something about kind of the um, orthogonality of the gradient vector that I talked about in the last video before we talk about this, because I don't want you to get confused about the diagram. So when I was talking about, sorry, I got to scroll here, when I was talking about using the gradient vector as a normal vector, there was, I was linking it to one thing, and maybe I should write this down. So if you want to add this into your notes from the last video, go ahead. Okay, the gradient vector, okay, as we saw in these examples, examples like one and two and three, the gradient vector of a function of x and y, okay, that is going to be, um, is orthogonal to level curves. Okay, so that would be like if we had a function f of x and y and we set it, or that's the same thing as z, and we set it equal to a constant. Okay, so that would look like, let's say, like x squared plus y squared equals c. Okay, so a gradient vector of two dimensions is orthogonal to level curves. The application I was showing you here is if we instead treat a surface... So we treat a surface, a difficult surface, okay, as a level surface of f of x, y, and z equal to a constant. So basically, we're, we would have to treat the surface, treat the surface that we're dealing with as a specifically like a a level surface of a bigger function, then gradient f of x, y, and z is orthogonal to the level surface. Okay, so what I'm about to do down, so one, we are normally dealing with this, okay? This application just allows us to find a tangent plane for particularly difficult surfaces, surfaces where we have we have defined um, we define z implicitly, right? Like these down here, where I said it's really difficult to solve for z. Here, it's really difficult to solve for z. This one, it would be impossible to solve for z. Okay, so if we want to find a tangent plane, we can think about these equations as kind of level surfaces of a larger function. Okay, but what we're dealing with most often is a gradient that only has two dimensions. We've already defined z to be a surface very explicitly. And that's what we've done down here. So this is where I wanna go to this surface here. This is something we have defined as f of x and y equals z. So when I find the gradient vector on this equation, it will look like this okay it will look like some kind of two two-dimensional vector okay so it might not be orthogonal to this surface is what i'm trying to say that's important because we're about to use the direction of the the gradient vector for something very specific okay so we want to prove that the direction that in which the surface increases most rapidly, how do we get to the top of the mountain the fastest, that direction is actually given by the gradient. Okay, so we prove this by looking at the directional derivative formula here. If we have a function of x, f of x and y, then the directional derivative for any direction can be given by dotting the gradient with a unit vector. Okay, so a unit vector would be given some direction here, okay? And um, the gradient vector would be taken at this point, okay? And we're not 100% sure, since we don't have it in general, it could be going this way, this way, this way, 
the gradient vector itself before we dot it could be going in any number of directions. Okay. Um, in fact, we know <laughs> that it's going to point this way, okay, which is actually the same direction as the unit vector. Now, how do we know that? Okay, let's look at this. We can replace the dot product formula with the formula we found in chapter 11. The magnitude of the gradient times the magnitude of the unit vector times the cosine of the angle in between them. Now, that angle is phi. That angle is phi because this direction we're drawing is in the xy plane, okay? And our gradient vector is coming out of the surface somewhere. So our it's not going to be theta because theta would be down here, okay? It's going to be phi, that angle we talked about in chapter 11, um, as kind of our, the angle coming down from the z-axis, okay? Here it's just drawn this way, okay? But phi being the angle in between, in between the gradient vector and our direction vector. Now, next step is the fact that our, our direction vector, okay, is a unit vector, so the length is one. So that simplifies to be gradient of the function multiplied by cosine of the angle in between the surface, okay, that gradient vector on the surface, and the unit vector. Now, when will this be maximized? That's our big question. When will this be maximized? When cosine of phi, when cosine of phi is equal to one. Well, that happens, okay, when phi is equal to zero. That means that the unit vector, okay, and the gradient vector should be pointing in the same direction in order to maximize the directional derivative. So in fact, okay, our direction, if this were the case, okay, I should actually draw my directional derivative or my direction to be going this way. Okay, we would want it in that direction. Okay, if, um, excuse me, the minimum value, that's what I wanted to say next, would be when um, it is the exact opposite. So when cosine of phi is at its absolute minimum, which would be negative one, which is when phi equals pi, so they would be going in opposite directions. Okay, all right, so, so big, big conclusion. The maximum directional derivative, okay, the direction, excuse me, excuse me, two different things. I apologize. I want to be really clear, okay? The direction of the maximum directional derivative, okay, is given by the gradient at that point, okay? The maximum value of the directional derivative is the magnitude of the gradient vector at that point. And that's given here, okay? Because the maximum cosine could be would be one. Okay, all right, two big takeaways.